In this episode of my podcast, Relentless Life on Your Terms, Season 2, Episode 15, I sit down with Bianca from Life Wealth, who's a third generation entrepreneur and has over 20 years experience. We talk about the importance of financial literacy in females, and all people for that matter, and how she pivoted her business through COVID over 30 employees, and how she stayed relevant to her clients and her communication. If you like my content, don't remember to share, like, and subscribe. Thank you. Now, welcome to my podcast. I, the lovely Bianca Dowdle Munro joins us. How are you, Bianca? I'm terrific. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, I have a very special guest. She's been in business for over 20 years. Now, not many people can say they've been in business for five years, let alone 10, let alone 20. So, first of all, congratulations for lasting that test of time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I know you've been in quite a few businesses. Now, a few yeah. things that did call my interest, you're actually into financial wealth. Yes. You help people become financially secure. Yes. Tell, tell the audience a little bit about yourself, a bit about what you do, and how long you've been in business for. We've already said 20 years. What made you get into, into um, empowering people financially? Yeah, so I started um, business really, really early, and that that fundamentally came from um, my own upbringing. Um, my my parents were both in business, and my grandparents were in business. So, um, and interestingly enough, of of my grandparents' family, um, nearly all of the generation have all been in business. We've never we've never really worked for for anyone else other than ourselves. And that includes- You're saying you're third generation? Yeah, I'm third generation. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. So okay. um, so my grandparents, my parents and their siblings, and then all of obviously my cousins. Um, yeah, predominantly all of us are in business for ourselves, which has been really a testament of, of my grandparents and their entrepreneurial ship. Um, back in those, you know, early days of the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. So, um, so really, I guess, you know, it's, it's systemic for me to have always continued down that path, aside from the fact that I'm probably not too great at uh, letting people tell me what to do. So it's sort you're of a natural progression. It's part of being a great entrepreneur, so you're a leader, not a follower. Now, let yeah. Me I'd like to understand a little bit about your origin of your story. And I've got some interesting facts that I'd like to touch on because they're very important as well. What line of business were your grandparents in? Is it the same line of business or are you just all entrepreneurs in general? So they were in hospitality and farming. Okay. Um, yeah, so my grandfather actually built the first hotel motel in um, country Victoria. Um, yeah, back in back in the uh, early seventies, which was in Shepparton, so um, so that's where that came from. But they also were very heavily in farming, so cropping and also uh, cattle and sheep. Um, so that was that was really where that came from. Um, and then subsequently, you know, my my other family members have gone into very similar areas as well. Um, and as the generations have passed, we've obviously branched into our own industries um, as time's gone on. So you're you're into you're into well part of your business because I know you do a lot of things. You do medical, you do hospitality, you do wealth management. I'd yeah. like to touch on the wealth management because obviously it's something that I'm into as well. Yeah, why absolutely. Get, why did you get into wealth management? Why do you think it's so important? Yeah, interesting. Um, so my first degree at university was architecture interior design. And I felt as though I just wasn't getting enough. I knew that I wasn't going to have enough contact with people. Um, yeah, I was going to build beautiful homes and buildings and bits and pieces, but really was it helping? Um, and so I took a bit of a secondment for 12 months and I found myself working in a financial planning firm and I loved it. And I said to my boss at the time, you know, how would you feel if I was to go and educate myself and, and you know, go down that path? And she said, I think you would be brilliant at it. Um, so whilst I worked, um, I also studied um, on the side, um, obviously my commerce and bits and pieces. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, that was 16 years ago um, in, in, um, in wealth management and I've, I've been doing it ever since. And I think the thing that I love is, is the education, the empowerment and turning someone's life around from when they come to you thinking that they can't achieve something to 
putting something in front of them that gives them a roadmap that allows them to see, oh, yeah, even though they've still got that little, you know, demon in the background saying, oh, I'm still not sure, I'm still not sure, but um, being able to also then, you know, hold their hand through that process and, you know, ultimately getting to, you know, that place where you get a phone call or you're doing a review or whatever it may be and they say, hey, listen, guess what? We, we finally did that. We've been able to achieve that. And um, I guess for me, that's that's the greatest reward that you could possibly ever have is being able to change somebody's life. It's it's just incredible. And look, I can definitely resonate with that. When I have clients say to me, Chris, I never would invest in roles with you or your company. That's the reason we get out of bed in the morning. And usually it's a fear of lack of knowledge or not knowing who to speak to as the professionals. Because once you have the right information, and you have the right people that can guide you and navigate you through investing, it gets easier the second, third, fourth time, like everything does because it breeds competence. Yes. So I think experience is very important. And, and I also love, um, and I see yourself being a, a woman in business. I love that because having three daughters myself and my wife is also a powerful woman and she's in business. I love seeing that because it, it shows that everyone should be independent okay. in the boardroom and out of the boardroom too. And, Women are giving us a, show, a run for our money. I go to my <laughs> I'm scared. I've got 70% females in my office. I said, I'm worried that I'm going to come in and I'm going to be out of my office as well. One of my <laughs> daughters is going to come and throw me out. So lucky for me, they're young. So I've got another 15 years until that happens, maybe 2025. 20, yeah. And then I'm in trouble, I think. Hey, at least you know it's going to be in good hands. Well, as I said, the day that she starts here, my youngest daughter, is the day I said to my mother-in-law, who's my CFO, that I resign. I go, I, I, wouldn't be, I can't handle her now when she's three. When yeah. she's 20, I said, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> Let me ask you a couple of questions. Have you always been passionate about networking and building relationships? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, like I said to you, you know, I moved out of um, architecture and interior design to be, you know, more, more active um, on the relationship side of things. It's really, really important to me. I grew up in an, in an environment where, you know, my parents always had, um, lots of people around, we're always hosting and bits and pieces. So I've always been a, a people person and um, COVID's really um, been a bit of a struggle for me from that perspective, not being able to, you know, see not just my family and friends, but also my wider community of colleagues um, in the, you know, different businesses that I'm uh, associated with. So um, I think that one of the biggest keys to business is relationships um, and also having not, not a big network, but a strong network that you can always pick up the phone if the good for both, for good and also bad, if you're looking for advice or whatever it might be, being able to pick up that phone um, to, your, to your network is, um, is absolutely paramount. And I know that definitely in the last 12 months, um, being able to do that has steered me um, to a place that, um, you know, it has sort of set me up for 2021 that's going to look a lot different to 2020. So um, I'm extremely passionate about it. I think in order to have successful businesses, you need it. Um, and um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what 2021 is going to look like post COVID. Well, you know what, it's always your network is your net worth. And it's yeah. so important as well. Relational capital is so often overlooked, but the importance of having strong relationships, that's how I rebuilt my career. When I started Remington almost 16 years ago, it's through a contact that I had in 2008 when I got an investor on board, it's because you vetted me and knew who I was. So relational capital is so pivotal to building any business or Absolutely. businesses, because you always need to be surrounded with great people. Oh, and you always need to run boards. And as, as we spoke before as well, I always believe in having mentors and coaches with business to help you along the line. But being surrounded with good people is so important. Yeah. Who, who's been one of your role models growing up? Now, you've had a big influence with your family, but who, who's been one of your role models? Yeah, look, I've had to really sit sit with this because um, my biggest role model was my grandmother. Um, you know, she, she, she raised six children. Um, you know, we've got a photo of her where she had her youngest um, on her hip as she was herding cattle in just before she was going in to do something at the, at the, um, you know, the restaurant or the motel. Um, she was, she was entrepreneurial. She was kind. She was loving. Um, she was just, 
a incredible woman that ever, you know, graced the presence of this world. And um, she taught me about strength and resilience. And um, yeah, she, she is 100% my role model. Um, okay. She was just an all rounder and just such a terrific person. And, you know, it's interesting that when, when she passed away, um, someone came and said to me, the only time I ever felt safe was when I was in your grandmother's presence. And I mean, what do you say to that? You know, she was just yeah, she was bigger than life. She was amazing. When you hear stuff like that, and actually it makes me happy, it sounds like a remarkable human being. Well, I, what, what a pillar of support for you. And yeah. what, and obviously you're going to pass that on to your daughter as well in generations. Well, yeah, I, I actually named my um, daughter after her. Oh, uh, it was Alice. Yeah. So yeah. It's a tradition in ours as well. We um we usually name ours after our, our grandfather. I'm the third son, so both of my grandfathers got named. So Pat is my oldest brother. Yes. My um mum's father. Zen is my dad's, is my sorry, my dad's father's the oldest, my mum's mm -hmm. father's the youngest. Now I've got no grandfather left. So they named me after my godfather. What name was he? Chris. What's yeah. my name? Christophe. <laughs> I said, come on, you had a, all the names in the world. I'm Christopher. You landed on a Chris. So that's why I'm Christopher. I'm the third son. So I ran out of grandfathers. I got my godfather. There you go. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. And it gets even funnier. It's actually, this story blew my mind. So my, my wife is the middle of three daughters. Mm -hmm. Her name's, well, Billy, she calls herself, Viflem, named after her grandmother. Mm -hmm. Name was supposed to be Christina. Oh, you're kidding. Christina Christoffi. Now, by the way, they love the name that much. Their third daughter's Christina. Oh. We were this close to being Chris Christina Christoffi. <laughs> so there you go. It's, it's, some things are just meant to be cosmetic. Oh, absolutely. The world works in really mysterious ways, right? Now, a couple more things now. Tell me a time in your business because you've been around... 20 years in business, which, as we yeah. said, was a remarkable feat. Yeah. The chips are down. It's very challenging. And you just have to back yourself and go all in. Give yeah. Me, give me a time when that happened, because I'm sure there probably was multiple times. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, um, you know, talking about financial planning, obviously we had the GFC in 2008 and subsequently we've also had what's, you know, whatever they're going to call um, 2020. Um, and, you know, we, for, for prime example this year, I mean, we, we've got 35 staff, plus we've got staff um, sitting overseas and we've got two offices. And, you know, when we went into lockdown in March, um, whilst I've got business partners um, as well, but the reality was, is that we, you know, we had to, we had to move really quickly. We had to have all of our staff set up um, and, really at the end of the day, um, it came down to, we just needed to make sure that our clients knew that they were okay, um, that their money was gonna be okay, and that the plans that they had for the future were going to be okay. And I remember the first couple of, probably the first six weeks um, when we went into lockdown, um, I mean, you know, my voice was raspy every, every, nearly every single day because of the amount of phone calls that I was making to clients just to make sure that they knew that we, we had their backs, um, that we were looking at things on the daily and that, um, you know, we were going to do everything that we had to do day or night um, to make sure that they were protected and that their assets were protected. And the feedback that we had from clients whilst, you know, we were doing 100-hour weeks um, and, you know, not seeing our families and, and awfully tired um, was that they knew that there was something really big happening um, they knew it was something that they couldn't control, but the fact that they had us looking after them um, was a godsend and, in fact, went back to what our mission was, and that was to provide peace of mind. So um, in those types of instances, you just have to back yourself um, and you, you really don't have a choice to think about anything else other than, you know, looking after your clients. And we did exactly the same in the GFC. I just make you. sure that you know, um, our clients knew that we were there for them, um, knew that what our strategy was around it, that was really important, knew, knew how we were going to manage it, what, how, you know, what we were looking at, what we were doing, why we were doing it and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and really just, yeah, backing ourselves in and, and staying true to our word, you know, our spoken word was always the most important thing. 
So um, we've come out of both of those situations not losing any clients, which I think is a real, um, you know, kudos to us. Massive. Um, I mean, you know, Life Wealth in itself has been around for 22 years. It's not an old company. It's not a young company. Um, and we've got very long-standing clients. Um, and I think it attributes to, you know, how we manage ourselves and our staff and our clients on an ongoing basis. We sort of see ourselves, I guess, as a bit more of a, a family orientated, um, you know, clients have got our mobiles. They can ring us at any time they like, day or night. Um, and um, yeah, we're, we are really there for them. It's really about them and their journey. Um, and we just facilitate that. Very well said, look, and you, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head and you resonate a lot with our philosophy. And when, when all this stuff came down in two days, you've got to work from home. I said, the main thing that's important here is that we communicate to our clients that we're here, that we're going to keep them informed. Yeah. We're going to be here at the end of it and we're going to be okay. Don't yeah. tell them it's going to be easy and all rosy because we, we need to be honest with our communication. Absolutely. Yeah. Communication is key. Absolutely. We maintain that across the board as well. And having similar, you know, we've got, I've got quite a few family members in the business. We've got a team now of over uh, close to 60 now. And we're, wow, that's incredible. Yeah. We, we, during the, during COVID, we put on 14 people. So we've really expanded because I see 2021 is a great opportunity. And I said to the team, I really want us to position ourselves for what's going to be an amazing year next year. More importantly, I want to overstaff our areas where we need our customer communication, our customer service, because now's when people need it. Because when there's time of uncertainty, people trust what they can hear and people trust communication. I said, we need to be consistent. When you said you, you, you're true by your vision, you haven't lost clients, that's a testament. It's, it's not maybe because of your team. It's exactly because of your team. It's exactly because of your culture. Yeah. There's, no, there's no other, I know you're modest by saying that, but being a business owner, it's 100% because of your team and you know that and the hours that you put in, you're yeah. appreciated and the results are in the, you know, the puddings in the results in the, what's yeah. the, I'm saying the results are in the. The proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding. There you go. <laughs> I got there in the end. It only took me four times, but I got there in the end. Now, um, you've got, uh, having three daughters as well, um, as I mentioned before, financial uh, independence is so important Yes, for, for all people, for women and for males, but obviously for females are very important, obviously due to the fact I have three daughters. Why do you think it's so important for females, for entrepreneurs to be independent? Why is the finance more important than ever now, do you think? Um, look, I guess, I guess I can only sort of talk about my own story. Um, Chris, to be honest with you. And I think the most important thing for me has always been, and it's something that I learned from my from my family and my grandparents. And, and look, it probably goes back um, to the fact that um, my, my parents were really, really wealthy in the 80s. Um, and then they separated. And during that separation, unfortunately, um, a lot of wealth was lost. And, you know, they've had to work tirelessly to, um, to, to get that back. And I guess that that was a lesson for me as a female that nothing's ever certain and that you always need to make sure that you are, um, you've always got fi financial stability in order to be able to always make correct choices and actions because I think what happens a lot of times is that when you don't actually have that financial stability and it actually becomes an anxious um, situation that you actually make decisions that you normally wouldn't make you make choices that you wouldn't normally make so um do you think that's how I don't care. You don't have the options Bianca just Absolutely. sorry there. do you think Absolutely. it's because you haven't got the resources behind you, you haven't got the team you're, and when you're desperate and you haven't got options, you usually become more emotional. Why, why do you think the reason people make the wrong decisions are there? Absolutely. Look, I do a lot of neutral divorce. And what that is, is I work with a lot of solicitors in um, trying to attain a situation where we work very closely with the couple and we actually talk about what is the most fair distribution of assets when it comes to the separation of a relationship. And... Um, what comes from that is that ultimately at the end of the day, 
the, the, the couple are not making a decision from an emotional perspective, they're making a decision from a fair and reasonable perspective. And if there's children involved, then obviously they're making a decision about what's fair and reasonable for the children as well. So, um, you know, that's just one aspect about why I see, you know, education for women being so important because a lot of the times they may look at an asset and not actually understand what the me mechanics of it is because they've always allowed somebody else to look after it. It might be systemic from, you know, um, uh, intergenerational, um, like, you know, mum and dad, well, dad always looked after the finances or, um, you know, my grandparents always looked after the finances or whatever it might be. I don't think that we've ever been engaged. And not only that, Chris, but, you know, I've worked in financial planning for 16 years. I would only say probably in the last three years, maybe four years, has any form of focus or marketing been directly related to females. It's always been very masculine. It's always been very much, I mean, you only have to look at the big four banks. You only have to have a look at, you know, um, other investment houses. They're all, all their branding's very masculine. It's always very focused towards a male orientated um, consumerism. Whereas now there seems to be a lot more of a softening of that type of marketing and that focus, which is very much female focused. And that is because the coming of times, I mean, you know, the ASX it means that, you know, the ASX have put out that in order to be on um, the ASX, you know, you need to have females on your board. So there is a coming of time. I think there's a coming of um, mentality as well in understanding that it actually doesn't matter um, what your gender is, what your religious background is, um, what your nationality is, what colour you are or anything else. If you've got the skills to be able to do a job, then you should be the person that's in that role. And, and so, made equally as well, opportunity should be equal. Absolutely. So, but I still think that unfortunately, because I mean, you know, women have been trying to push this through for, for tens of you know tens of years, decades, but it's really coming to a point. And as you know, 70% of your work staff are female. We're no different. 65% of our um, staff are female. So, um, and, and I'm not about the gender bits and pieces in any way, shape or form. I just think that there is equality across the board, regardless of who you are and where you come from. But there is still a gap in that education piece for females. Um, and that's just because of, of where we've come from. Um, and I just think that it's important that, and, and as you know, I've, I've created um, the company Women Wealth and Wellness, and that is really a hub for women to be able to access the information that they need, not just on a, on a um, financial aspect, but also on a wellness, because we know that wellness is also so directly related to your finances. If you've got control of your finances, um, and you've got money in the bank and you don't need to worry. And as we were saying before, you don't need to make um, desperate decisions about things. Then you actually have better health because you're not stressed about money. You've got time because time, time allows you to buy options, as you said. And I'm very glad that the world's heading that way. I do think you should find the most qualified person. But like, I like to throw a spanner in the works. And I think, I think men and females... They bring different skill sets to the table and using both of them when they say they should be females on the board, I think you're going to get a better outcome when you can mix both genders because I think there's certain aspects females are stronger than men. I think there's certain aspects men are stronger. Absolutely. By combining the two and working together, Correct. I do think the right person will get the job, whether you're male or female, that goes without saying. But when you've got a board or you've got a big company, without a doubt, it should be spread across both genders. So I think you'll get the best outcome. We I do have skill you. sets. That, that are better than each other, gender. That's just my opinion anyway. No, and I, I actually agree 100% with you, Chris. Now, I've got a couple of uh, backgrounds. You have an, a, an ancestor, Bianca, by the name of, how do I, Caroline, how do I say her surname? Caroline Chisholm. Caroline Chisholm. who was a yeah. 19th century English humanitarian known for her immigrant female and welfare work. Did, did yeah. you know that before you got into all this stuff or did that contribute and say, wow, I do have a background in this as well. I have an ancestor. Do you know, it's really interesting. Um, I didn't know that. I wanted to no. know that because when I thought that, like, I need to know. Did she know this beforehand? Yeah. No, I didn't know. I didn't know. Um, 
I didn't know and it wasn't until my grandmother said, um, oh, it's really interesting that you're heading down that path. Um, Unbelievable. Yanks. And I said, why is that? And they said, oh, well, did you know that Caroline Chisholm was actually one of your ancestors who is very was very much in this whole um, sphere of, you know, humanitarianism and um, women and, and so on and so forth. So, of course, you know, I got quickly Googling and bits and pieces. Um, so, yeah, no, I didn't know. I didn't know. So you're, you're holding the flag up for the, your family. That's fantastic. Now, Bianca, thank you very much for sharing all your information and your knowledge. I love what you're doing. I've really enjoyed our chat. Are you ready for our quick fire questions? Go for it. All right. Now, you can answer the first thing that comes to mind and you can say pass also. Sure. Do you have any pets? No. Favorite color? Green. What's your favorite TV show? Mm, blacklist. Blacklist. Okay. And what is your, give me, you mentioned this, your role model growing up, your grandmother, anyone yes. else? Um, look, I think Oprah has done amazing things for women. No one can dispute that. Describe yourself in three words as a teenager. Oh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, Self-reliant, um, strong, and rebellious. <laughs> this is all fun. Now, um, one item you can't leave the house without besides your phone. My keys. Best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, best piece of advice is that um, um, the difference between who you are and where you want to be is the actions that you take. 100%. Words are cheap. It's the actions you take every day that determine. I love that. If you could have one last meal, what would it be? One last meal? Oh, it would have to be, it'll be pasta of some description. I love pasta. Now, do you name one book that, that, that you read that's positively influenced you or shaped you? Um, I love the I love a book by the name of um, Brendan Borchard. It's called the Manif It's called the um, oh, um, oh, what's it called? Oh my goodness, what is that book called? I think I actually know the one you're referring yeah, to. Yeah, it's, it's, um, oh, it's the Manifesto. It's called the Manifesto. I've, I've heard of that yeah. book. I, I, someone recommended it. I haven't bought it yet, but I've heard of it. Best gift you've ever received? Alice. Of course. My if, daughter. You had, if you had one superpower, what would it be? To heal people. And I don't mean just physical. I mean mental, emotional, the whole works. You would have had a lot of work this time with COVID. Yeah, I know, but wouldn't it have been nice to be able to save some lives? It would, it would have been, it would have been. And hopefully a lot of people will come out the other end. I think speaking to people is so important. If you were working in your current career, now you've, you've dabbled in quite a few industries, what would you be doing? Ooh. Um, I think I'm, I'm doing exactly what I've always been meant to do. So you're in exactly where you need to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm exactly where I need to be. When you started your career, what was one of the hardest things that you learned? Um, I think probably the hardest thing for me was, you know, I was in a male dominated um, industry and I would go to conferences and I'd be, you know, there'd be a thousand people there and I'd be probably five of women. So holding my own in a feminine space um, rather than reverting to a masculine was probably the biggest thing that I had to learn, yes. And all the power to you, and I know a lot of very powerful, smart women, but just remember one thing, Bianca, when you guys do get to that point, don't throw us men out, yeah? Just <laughs> supporting no, people. absolutely not. <laughs> I'm not ready to get I'm rid of you yet. Very supportive. Now, um, from this episode, if, for our listeners, if you could give two, three key takeaways you want someone to take away from them, mm -hmm. you've given, you've shared so many, what would they be? Um, one would be um, education. 
you know, a lot of a lot of people say, um, you know, you can you can do a lot on thirty thousand um, dollars. Da 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 da. My whole thing is educate, 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 and constantly increase your income, inca income, 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 and look for those opportunities. Never say no. Always say yes. Um, the second thing I would say is always stay humble, um, regardless of of how big you get, how big your bank balance gets, um, stay humble and be kind. Um, and the third one I would say is um, you only get one chance at this life. Do everything you can to make sure that you follow your dreams and do not let, allow anybody to steer your path. I love that too. And be, being humble and kind, I think that's the measure of a great person. I think success doesn't build character, it reveals it, it just accentuates who you are as a person. Yeah. I, I think my the post I actually did yesterday on LinkedIn covered these specific topics. There's something very, very close to me. Um, finally, uh, Bianca, thank you very, very much for your time. Um, you've been an amazing guest. I've learned so much today. And definitely will our paths will cross again very soon i'll let you know when we are you have a great day thanks bianca thanks chris